Dennis Hopper, Stephen Dorff, Debbie Mazar, and Charles Dance. In Space Truckers, what could go wrong? It is the year 2196. The fiercely independent cargo hauler John Canyon faces a rough road as he attempts to stay in business transporting shipments through the galaxy. When John teams up with Mike Pucci to deliver a mysterious cargo for an astronomical payday, a grizzled trucker takes to the stars for a big score, only to find that he's in for a load of trouble. Along with stowaway Sydney, John and Mike undertake an out-of-this-world adventure with nothing less than the fate of the universe at stake. Space Truckers, from 1997, 97 minutes. Stuart Gordon's Space Truckers is a comedy adventure and nothing more. John Canyon, played by Dennis Hopper, loses out on a big contract, so he decides to go independent space trucking and runs into the young hotshot, played by Stephen Dorff. He's hanging out with his girlfriend, Cindy, who also had, like, his, he has, she has history with John. Apparently they were engaged at one point. So John's dealing with that. So there's a little bit of a love triangle. They're thrown into this uh, adventure. Dr. Nabel, played by Charles Dance, creates this crazy, like, cyborg-looking monster-type thing with his one goal in mind to have complete domination of the universe and particularly Earth. So the space trucker contract that Dennis Hopper's character, John, takes is transporting 5,000 of these cyborg type things that Dr. Nabel has created. Once the plan is is uh, brought to the forefront, the three of them are trapped into this adventure. And there's a lot, there's some cool stuff in this. There, you know, it's just to, totally pure 90s. There's some crazy cheesy effects that look like they're from right straight out of Windows 95. You can actually see the cables on the stunt people as they fly backwards. Barbara Crampton shows up at the end. She plays a pivotal role. Did I have a good time space trucking? I did. But I would recommend this movie only for fans of space truckers. So if you guys are fans of space truckers, I would recommend this release. It was released this year by Shout Factory. It's part of the Screen Factory line. And comes with new interviews with actor Barbara Crampton, Space Trucking with Stuart Gordon, which is a fantastic interview with Stuart Gordon. It gives really insight into the production. Apparently the movie was supposed to go theatrical, but ended up going straight to HBO stateside. I thought it was theatrical. I thought this is, you know, one of those movies that just bombed theatrically, but to find out that they went to straight to television, very interesting. This is the debut on Blu-ray. There was only like 1,500 of these made. I think they're still available on the website as of this recording. But then we also have interviews with the composer, scoring Space Truckers, the artist Space Truckers, interview with the art director. I will say that a lot of the costumes are outrageous and colorful, and Stuart Gordon says that when you're in space, that you want to see more color. And, and so I recommend this Blu-ray for the special features mainly. I really enjoy the special features more than the feature. But if you're a fan of Space Truckers, this is actually the definitive collection, the definitive edition to get. As far as the picture quality, it looks average. It looks like a, you know, a nice average blu-ray the sound design actually was really a highlight you could really hear full balanced bass and treble and everything was really in sync and i didn't have to adjust my volume at all if you're a fan of this movie uh, this is my first time viewing it i don't know if i'm a fan or not yet yeah let me know what you guys think of space truckers <laughs> Somewhere in the fields of Indiana lives the mythical creature, the Corn Shucker. The Corn Shucker is a mythical creature who has lived simply and peacefully with nature, but now is besieged by urban sprawl. With nowhere else to go, he is forced to deal with varmints and outlandishly odd townsfolk. As his food supply diminishes, the Corn Shucker is confronted by the bigoted old man Thomas. In an act of desperation, the corn shucker is forced to do the unthinkable. His existence is in peril, 
and the mysterious world he inhabits could be destroyed. Only nature and the townsfolk will decide his fate. 63 minutes from 1997. The Corn Shucker. The Corn Shucker. This is released by VHS Hitfest, which is a partner label of Vinegar Syndrome. So what is The Corn Shucker? There's been a lot of comparisons to like David Lynch's Eraserhead, just David Lynch's work in general, as far as Twin Peaks, you know, the surrealism, the Midwest, and you get that, you get the, you know, does it hold exactly like David Lynch water, does it, does it, is it really like David Lynch-esque, is it Eraserhead? No, it's not as good as Eraserhead. I don't think it set out to be that. It set out to be like this entertaining, like, dark comedy. And that's what you get. You get this dark comedy where this alien-type corn shucker fish-head-type... Like, he has... He, he he sees things, and we get this, like, crazy, like, fish-eye, fish-bowl effect. Like this, on the cover. The black and white, it looks a little creepy. But is this movie really that creepy? Not really. Anytime that... There maybe might be suspense. It turns into like a dance number. Or the corn shucker hangs out with Elvis at one point. Go in blind. You know, show your friends. Be like, hey, let's get a, you know, put this on. Have a good time. I would say one comparison I would make would be like the corn shucker. I would compare him to Groot from Guardians of the Galaxy. Whereas the corn shuckers, both characters, Groot and the corn shucker, rely on their own phrase as their language. So the corn shucker, whereas, you know, Groot has, I am Groot, that's like his language. The corn shucker has, I know. So he keeps saying, I know, to like everything. You're not going to get a lot of character development in the corn shucker. And I don't think you're supposed to. I think it's just more of like this surreal dark comedy. What I really appreciate, though, is the independent filmmaking behind it. So Brando Snyder gives an interview about the making of and how he took out a loan or for five or six grand and, and, and wanted to kind of make this movie. He was inspired by El Mariachi, by Robert Rodriguez. And so he decided, hey, I can make my own movie. I'll raise the money or take out a loan and, and, and make it and make it happen and I'll use family members and people that I know and just local town people hey show up and I need a crowd so let's show up for the scene so there's really like this community push behind it and I really appreciated that you know as far as an independent filmmaker I appreciated that you know the director set out to execute this certain vision and I think that they succeeded on that level so I would recommend this movie as far as like an inspirational thing if you're to any independent filmmaker out there I think you need to watch projects like the corn shucker that will inspire you to make your movie just make your movie like if you have a vision write it out shoot it we can shoot it down on a, on a, on a cell phone make it happen this movie was shot on 16 millimeter the 16 millimeter negative was lost so all that they had was a VHS copy I think the way that it's presented as a VHS essentially on this blu-ray it, it kind of works in the favor of the movie like it feels like a movie that was made decades before the 90s it has that old kind of old kind of timey feel so i think it works to its advantage what did you guys think of the corn shucker have you guys watched it i had never heard of it i blind bought this totally on a whim so special features include audio commentary by director brando snyder interview with director brando snyder so a lot of good stuff there music video and a still gallery. If you guys picked up Corn Shucker, let me know in the comments. Come on in, let's check out the museum. Inside the wax museum, a group of teenagers are aghast as the hauntingly lifelike wax displays of Dracula, the Wolfman, the Mummy, and other charter members of the Horror Hall of Fame. Each display is perfectly grotesque, yet each is missing one thing, a victim. Admission to the waxwork is free, but now they may pay with their lives. One by one, the students are drawn into the settings as objects of the bloodthirsty creatures. They are now part of the permanent collection known as waxwork. 
1988, Waxwork, 97 minutes. So, from uh, director Anthony Hickox, Waxwork 1, Waxwork, we have these college students are invited for free to do this wax museum. So they go, uh, six are allowed in. The displays are cool, like the whole set pieces of this movie are really awesome, really well elaborate. They look cool, practical. Uh, a werewolf wolf man is set up on the on a wa- like a wax display. Dracula, the mummy, a lot of the Hall of Fame horror creatures are in this museum, um, but they're missing like victims. So one of the students crosses the ropes and heads into this portal, which is sort of like a, a time machine or time, a, a, another dimension. So they're sent into like the actual scene that the wax display is is showing. For example. One is attacked by a werewolf in the other dimension and becomes part of the wax museum. So that's kind of the whole idea. And I thought a lot of the effects were cool. Some cool kills, some cool effects, some cool gore, if you're into that. I didn't find it too over the top. I didn't find it too cheesy. I mean, it's there is camp, but I didn't find it too distracting. I had a good time. The Vestron release is loaded with features. Audio commentary by Anthony Hickok and, and Zach Galligan. Theatrical trailer, a still gallery. But the best part is the featurettes, the Waxwork Chronicles, parts one through six, which is like an hour and a half, just as long as the movie about behind the scenes, how they did it. I mean, there's one comment by the director, Anthony Hickox, about how they had one day left to shoot the final scene which is a chaotic scene they got it done in 13 hours somehow it's just that's filmmaking you know you're running running low on money you gotta shoot the thing and there's also like a vintage making of featurette so this there's quite a bit here if you guys are fans of wax work and i gotta say i'm a fan of the first one i'm a fan of this one let me know below what you guys thought of wax work Well, you knew they couldn't stay away, they made a sequel. Having escaped the fiery destruction of the original Waxworks, Mark and Sarah face another grueling ordeal in Waxworks 2, Lost in Time, when Sarah is accused of murdering her stepfather, fleeing through the doors of time in a desperate search for proof of her innocence. The two lovers find themselves caught in the eternally recurring battle between good and evil. Together, they must stop one of the most powerful and demonic figures of all time. Lord Scarabus from 1991, Waxworks 2, Lost in Time. 109 minutes. All right, Waxworks 2. Mark and Sarah are the only survivors of the first one. And Sarah is put on trial when a, also a survivor of the first movie, a severed right hand, follows Sarah home and murders... <laughs> murders her stepfather which is actually probably the best scene of the film the the creepy you know one little dismembered right hand the creepy creepy dismembered right hand creeping around the living room it's probably the best executed scene in this film the film waxworks 2 lost in time gets lost in its own way gets it gets in its own way and it turns into like a scary movie type movie like a parody of itself they start throwing in these references, which worked for the first film when they stuck with the Universal Monsters, but stuck with like the Horror Hall of Fame. It worked for the first film, but in this one, they get into like they start out with Frankenstein, which I'm cool with. It was fine. Then they go into like 2001: Space Odyssey. Then they go into Alien and Aliens, and it just becomes a mess. And the big bad, the Lord Scarabus. Who's supposed to be sort of this xenomorph type thing? It's like a xenomorph dinosaur looking. It's just it's not really well done. The effects are not as not as cool. It's more more comedy, more comedic. Like you have, you know, it's just over the top. It's 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 everything that was good in the first one is just not. It's just not good. Not not near as good as the first wax work. Unfortunately. You do have some cool cameos by Bruce Campbell and David Carradine, but did they save the film? No, absolutely not. I was 
unfortunately checked out by that time. And I was like, oh, really? They got David Carradine in here? Uh, I was like, okay, cool. I can't recommend Waxworks 2. As far as special features, there's only an audio commentary for Waxworks 2 by Anthony Hickox and Zach Galligan. So you had the you know you had the the director returned and the and the two leads of the first film returned, but it just didn't capture the magic of Waxworks One. But let me know in the comments, guys, what you guys thought of Waxworks Two, Lost in Time. This has been Return of the Disc. I'm Dan. For more Return of the Disc, visit returnofthedisc.com. Check out the audio version of today's show, available on all major podcast platforms. And be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel.